speak this month each week through those who stand in this pulpit about surviving the various realities of life which remind us we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. In Jesus name. Amen. I have said it before and I want to reiterate it again today that Christians have lost home field advantage. We're no longer the home team. If you are a serious Christian, not just a churchgoer, not just a religious person, not just somebody who believes in God, but somebody who believes God, then you are part of the visiting team. That means the crowd is not supporting you. It means the public is not in your favor. There was a time when if you were a serious Christian, you were the home team. You were supported in school. You were supported at home. You were supported in media. You were supported in the culture. Even if they didn't agree with you, they respected you enough to let your voice be heard. But you are the visiting team now. No longer do you live in a land that holds high the Judeo-Christian worldview. And the more serious Christian you are, the more isolated you're liable to be. So I don't want to paint the picture other than what reality says it is. We are, individually and collectively, as a ministry, your family, your definition of life, your definition of, of marriage, your definition of male-female realities, your definition of uh, dignity, your definition of, of appropriateness, your definition of, of life itself from womb to tomb has made you part of the visiting team. That, that is where you are. And as a result of that, loss of home field advantage. Many Christians have decided to become treasonist. They've decided to be nicknamed Benedict Arnold because they want to be accepted by the culture. They want to be affirmed by the culture. They want to be embraced by the culture. They want to be applauded by the culture at the expense of their commitment to Christ and their commitment to God and their commitment to truth based on his word. And the problem is that the Benedict Arnolds still go to church. That the Benedict Arnolds still has a religious facade that makes them feel part of the home team. All right, well... I do want to reiterate what Dr. Evans was saying there in that video, and that is simply that we find ourselves as the visiting team now in our nation. We are living in a post-Christian America, and Christians are now the visiting team. That wasn't always the case, by the way. America was founded on Christian principles. And as much as the culture and our, and our education systems want to tell us otherwise, our nation was founded by God-fearing people, not atheists, not irreligious people. It was founded by God-fearing people, those who desired to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And the Bible was the main textbook in schools. The Bible was the source of inspiration for our founding documents and system of government. I want to read to you a prayer that is recorded in St. Paul's Chapel in New York City as well as at Pohick Church in Fairfax County, Virginia. This is a prayer that was prayed by the first president of the United States, George Washington. He says this, Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou 
will keep the United States in thy holy protection, and thou will incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large, and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation, grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, Almighty Father, if it is thy holy will that, thou, that we shall obtain a place and name among the nations of the earth, grant that we may be enabled to show our gratitude for thy goodness by our endeavors to fear and obey thee. Bless us with thy wisdom in our counsels, success in battle, and let our victories be tempered with humility. Endow also our enemies with enlightened minds, that they become sensible of their injustice and willing to restore our liberty and peace. Grant the petition of thy servant for the sake of whom thou hast called thy beloved son. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Signed, George Washington. James Madison was considered the father of the Constitution and the fourth president of the United States. At the Constitutional Convention of 1787, James Madison proposed the plan to divide the central government into three equal branches. Listen, if you have your Bibles, this is not in your notes, but turn to Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 33. Turn to Isaiah chapter 33, and I want to read a verse with you this morning. James Madison, who was considered, like I said, the father of the Constitution, he turned to Scripture for advice and guidance on how to form our new government. And in the Constitutional Convention of 1787, James Madison read from Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, where he found the inspiration to form our government. And so Isaiah 33, verse 22, here is the outline for the government of the United States. And it is a picture of God and his characteristics. And it says in Isaiah 33, verse 22, it says this, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. And it is he who will save us. We see the three equal branches of government clearly defined in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. The Lord is our judge, the judicial branch. The Lord is our lawgiver, the legislative branch. And the Lord is our king, the executive branch of the United States. And that verse ends with this statement, it is he who will save us. For those who say that the United States was not founded on biblical principles are being dishonest about our history. But the reality is, is that we have come far from that place. We are no longer a Christian nation. We are now the visiting team. We have lost home field advantage. And Christian influence in our culture is no longer the dominant influencer. We've lost our foothold in the schools. We've lost our foothold in the business community. We've lost our foothold in government. And we've lost our foothold in society and in culture. It used to be, and I said this statement several weeks ago, it used to be that the culture was influenced by the church. But now the church is influenced by the culture. Noah, my son Noah, had his first game on Friday. He plays drums for the Hemet High band and so it was pretty awesome to be back out on the on the field and back out in in a normal setting like that and uh, so it was fun to be there and watch him playing 
And it reminded me back when I was in high school. I was a band nerd in high school, okay? But in Texas, where I went to high school, they weren't nerds, all right? I just want to clarify that. <laughs> we weren't nerds. We were really cool. And so, but, but I remember one day, one of the big rival schools that we always, uh, you know, competed with was, was Cleburne High School. So I went to Joshua High School. Cleburne was a neighboring town. And I remember being in the bleachers as a visiting team at the football game there in Cleburne. You know, when you're on the visiting team in the bleachers, your bleachers aren't as nice as the home team. Theirs are painted and have the logo of their school and the, the mascot on them. Ours are just bare metal, you know. And uh, if you go to Hammond High, it's the same, by the way, right? The bleachers are the same. The visiting team gets, you know, the second-class seats. And, uh, you know, when you're the visiting team, you don't have a big crowd there cheering you on. You don't have all of the students and the staff there and all of their paraphernalia, you know, their, their swag, their, their school swag, you know, wearing all the colors and things like that, cheering you on. And you feel like a second-class a tender. You feel like you have a disadvantage. And on, you know, one of the things that Hemet High was missing, and hopefully they'll fix this, but they didn't have their mascot out on Friday night. In fact, Katie was, said that to me because, by the way, this is a secret. You can't tell anybody this, all right? But, but Katie is the Dartmouth mascot over at Dartmouth Middle School. Now, nobody's supposed to know that. But if you ever see the Dartmouth night outside, you know, greeting kids or doing whatever, that's Katie, my daughter, all right? Anyway, so she says to me, she's all, where's the mascot? And sure enough, the mascot was missing. But I remember this day in Cleburne when we were playing against the Yellow Jackets. That's who they were. And by the way, their ma what is up with these mascots? Their mascot was the Yellow Jackets, which was not much worse than ours or better. Our school's mascot was an owl. We were the fighting owls. I mean, that's what we were, you know? And we were playing against the Cleburne Yellow Jackets. They were wasps. Anyways, I'll never forget this day when we were at the football game, and we're playing, and the football team's out there on the field, and our mascot, the owl, comes running out with a giant homemade fly swatter, okay? And he runs across to the other side of the field where the Yellow Jacket is, and he starts swatting this yellow jacket. And we erupted with laughter and cheers. It was amazing. That was really the only victory we had that day. <laughs> was, was the giant fly swatter. Listen, there's something about losing home field advantage. It, it knocks you off your, your game. It, it, it sets you back. You're, you're disadvantaged. You're in a foreign land. And I think Tony Evans is right. I think that we are living in a post-Christian America. I, I want to read to you some words that John records, or I'm sorry, not John, but John the Baptist. This is a story about John the Baptist in the book of Luke. This is in Luke chapter 3. And I just want to read um, a little excerpt here as John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. And he's describing Jesus. And so these are the words here recorded by Luke. Luke chapter 3. And I'm just going to begin reading in verse 15. John was ministering out to the people there and, and, uh, and baptizing people and doing all of these things that God had called him to do. He was preparing the way for the Messiah, for Jesus. And this is what Luke records there in Luke 3.15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. They thought maybe it was John. John answered them all. He says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the, exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Listen, I really believe that where we find ourselves today in our nation is in that place on the threshing floor. 
I think God has thrown the church in America and the world to the threshing floor. And here we find ourselves on the threshing floor, and he has his winnowing fork in his hand, and he is clearing the threshing floor and is separating the wheat from the chaff. And the church is in this place now of being thrashed, if you will, of being shaken. We're finding out what will remain after the shaking takes place. Now, let me say this. I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. I want to remind you that God is in control. And God is doing His work and His plan. And if it's His choice to throw the church to the threshing floor, that He might sift the wheat from the chaff, that is His prerogative. He is God, the creator of the universe. But nevertheless, here we are, and here we find ourselves in this place. Which brings us to Revelation chapter 3 today. We are going to be looking at the very last church that Jesus addresses here in Revelation chapter 3. This is the church of Laodicea. It is the church, I believe, that best describes the church in our present day. In fact, let's read this together. I'm just going to begin reading in verse 14 there in Revelation chapter 3. And again, John is recording this great vision that he has, and he's recording the words of Jesus himself. And here's what Jesus says in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. And so, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you may become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches." The first point today that I want to make with you is this, that to fix our problems, which I don't need to explain the problems, they're everywhere, okay? I mean, we have problems everywhere. In fact, there is a mess happening right now in Afghanistan. Franklin Graham has called us today as a nation to pray for the people who are in Afghanistan who are losing their lives currently because of their faith in Jesus Christ. It is a shameful day for our nation, and it is an, I hope it's an awakening for us as believers that we have it really good here in America. In spite of the challenges we face, we're not waking up this morning wondering if someone's going to knock on our door and behead us. But there are those in the world today that that is a reality for them. And so to fix our problems, we must appeal to our Creator. It's really interesting the way that Jesus describes Himself. You know that as we've been looking at these churches, Jesus describes Himself in very unique ways as He addresses each church. This particular church, He says to them, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And so Jesus is saying to them, He is the Amen. He is the affirmation of all things that are God and good. That's what amen is. It's an affirmation. It's a yes. It's a, it's a profound yes. 
And so these are the words of Jesus, who is the culmination of God, who is the very embodiment of God, who is the yes, the amen. He is the faithful and true witness of God. He is the ruler of all of God's creation. You know, I think one of the greatest attacks that the devil has brought on us today is the worshiping of God's creation rather than the worshiping of the Creator Himself. Our culture has bought into the idea that we have a Mother Earth who is our God, that we must bow to and worship and fear rather than the Creator Himself. And so the idea that we, we must save the planet, that we must do X, Y, and Z to help planet, the, our planet or Mother Earth, is a complete rejection of the one who created the earth, the one who holds the earth and the stars and the heavens in his hands. If the earth is in trouble and in need of healing, it is not humanity that can bring the healing. It is God himself. It is the Creator. And so as people worship the create, created things rather than the Creator, it is a complete rejection of God. And so we have these climate change initiatives. And these initiatives are a premise suggesting that, that we can save ourselves by saving our planet. And so many people have bought into this idea that in order to save humanity, we must save the planet. And that all sounds pretty good on the surface. But the fact is, is that we have forgotten that we are one nation under God. And that God is our King, not Mother Earth. And we are to seek His guidance and His blessing first. And if we hold true to the words of uh, in, that are recorded there in Second Chronicles, the word of God, as he says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. The healing of the land comes from God. It doesn't come from any man. I want to read to you a little bit out of Isaiah, and I think this is Powerful. This is quite a long little passage here. I'm just going to read it. You can listen or follow along. This is Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. In verse 21, this is God speaking. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its peoples are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens, speaking of God himself. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them, and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is, is disregarded by my God. Do you not know, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Paul says this about Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. He says, The Son, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything he might have, so in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth 
or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Listen, if we are to experience some healing, if we are to fix our problems, we must appeal to our Creator. There is no human plan, there is no human organization, there is no human idea that can fix our problems. There is only one, and that is God. And He says, you must come to Me. He is the Creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the source of all that is good. And if we are to fix the problems that we see around us, we must come to God. We must reject these ideas that are being promoted today about climate change and Mother Earth, and we can save the planet, and we can do all of these things. If we are to save ourselves and our planet, we must come to God. One of the interesting things about this church in Laodicea is that they fully believed that they had it all together. Jesus describes them as being rich. They were affluent. They had money. They had beautiful facilities. They were comfortable. They didn't worry about where the next meal would come from or if they would be able to eat or whatever it was. The people in this church were affluent, which I really think describes many of those in the church today. And it describes many of the churches in the Western world. And so the point is simply this, that if you try to play the middle, which is what this church was doing, if you try to play the middle and please both the world and Jesus, it's going to lead to a compromised life and to what Jesus describes as being lukewarm, which, by the way, is probably one of the worst things that you can be. He even says, I would rather you to be cold or hot than to be lukewarm. And so in Jesus' mind, in the mind of God, to be lukewarm is one of the worst places you can be. To have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God is the pure description of lukewarmness. Look at what he says in verse 15. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. And so because you are lukewarm, that you are neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, that you are pitiful, that you are poor, that you are blind, and that you are naked. I heard Greg Laurie say this, he says, show me a Christian who is compromised, and I'll show you a Christian who is headed for ruin. Show me a Christian who is compromised, and I'll show you a Christian who is headed for ruin. Charles Spurgeon, in one of his great sermons, a sermon entitled, An Earnest Warning Against Lukewarmness, he says this about lukewarmness. Now, he wrote this a long time ago, but listen to how the words ring true even today. He says this as he describes the lukewarm church. They have prayer meetings but there are few present, for they like quiet evenings alone. When more attend the meetings, they are still very dull, for they do their praying very deliberately and are afraid of being too excited. They are content to have all things done decently and in order, but vigor and zeal are considered to be vulgar. They may have schools, Bible classes, preaching rooms, and all sorts of agencies but they might as well be without them, for no energy is displayed and no good comes from them. They have deacons and elders who are excellent pillars of the church. If the chief quality of pillars be to stand still and exhibit no motion or emotion, the pastor does not fly very far in preaching the, go the, the everlasting gospel, and he certainly has no flame of fire in his preaching, the pastor may be a shining light of eloquence, but he certainly is not a burning light of grace, setting men's hearts on fire. Everything is done in a half-hearted, listless, dead, and alive way, as if it did not matter much whether it was done or not. Things are respectably done. The rich families are not offended. The skeptical party is um, conciliated. And the good people are not quite alienated. Things are made pleasant all around. 
the right things are done, but as to doing them with all your might and soul and strength, a Laodicean church has no notion of what that means. They are not so cold as to abandon their work or to give up their meetings for prayer or to reject the gospel. They are neither hot for the truth, nor hot for con conversions, nor hot for holiness. They are not fiery enough to burn the stubble of sin, nor zealous enough to make Satan angry, nor fervent enough to make a living sacrifice of themselves upon the altar of their God. They are neither cold nor hot. They are lukewarm. And I really believe that as Jesus is addressing the churches, this is the most profound and damning statement that he has made to a church to this point. You are the lukewarm church, and you disgust me to the point of making me want to vomit. That's what Jesus is saying to the church in Laodicea. The lukewarm Christian makes the Lord sick by denying Christ's deity. They don't believe that he says he is what he is. It's one of the reasons why Jesus says in his introduction, I am the creator. I, I hold all of this in my hands. He introduces himself as, as the son of God, the creator of the universe, the one who holds all the power. The lukewarm church has, has slowly walked its way into a place of complacency, of no fear of God, of not believing who he is and what he stands for. And thus they have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. And Jesus says, that type of living disgusts me. I would rather you'd have both feet in the world than to be halfway in between. Think about that for a minute. He'd rather you be the thief on the cross who cursed Jesus and said, die, than to be the Christian who has one foot in the world and one foot not. It's a damning statement. It should be a wake-up call to all Christians and believers today. You see, the lukewarm Christian has created a false God and is holding on to a false sense of security. They've painted a picture in their minds of being okay, when in fact God says, you are far from okay. You are wretched. You are poor. You are naked. You are blind. You are far from okay. The lukewarm Christian demonstrates pride in his humility. Think about that for a moment. The lukewarm Christian demonstrates pride in his humility. Look at how humble I am. Look at how great I am that I have attained this righteousness. I am humble. The lukewarm Christian is in of itself an oxymoron. They are what I would call a proud ragamuffin. I brought a little something to show you this morning. It's kind of, I'm going to do a little show and tell. Is that okay? Okay, good. So, sorry, sorry, Carissa, you're probably chasing me with the camera, or Lloyd. But this is Mickey Mouse. Okay, now this is not just an ordinary Mickey Mouse. This Mickey Mouse is my Mickey Mouse, okay? And I got this Mickey Mouse at Disneyland when I was probably, I'm gonna guess, five or six years old, okay? Now, you can't see it, but he's got dried bubble gum on his ear right here. And I was trying to clean it off last night, and I thought, well, that's not gonna come off. So I'm just gonna leave him there. But I brought my Mickey for you because to show you because he is my ragamuffin. When I was a little boy, I would carry this Mickey around. Just like most little kids have a little, uh, you know, doll or a blanket or something that they carry that helps them to fall asleep or helps them to feel safe and to reduce their anxiety and things like that. And so this little Mickey was my ragamuffin. It didn't matter what he looked like to me. It just mattered that he was with me. I found him in a box in the attic. I haven't actually held this thing in I don't know how long. But, uh, but I went last night and fished him out of the box so I could show you. 
This is my ragamuffin. The Christian church in Laodicea is much like this Mickey. Tattered, beat up, bubblegum on the ear. The paint on his eyes is coming off too, and I don't know what I did to his nose, but it looks like it's not in its original state. And Katie was looking at him this morning, and he's got some weird stitching on the back here, and I don't know if someone in my life, my mom or someone, stitched him up or if that's just how he came, but, but nevertheless, he's pretty beat up. And it would be foolish for this Mickey to say something along the lines of how amazing he is, because when we look at him, he's not amazing. He's a ragamuffin. Someone said he's cute. <laughs> Listen, the last point this morning is simply this. Even if you've wandered away from God, there is hope. He still loves you. He's offering you a wealth of heavenly blessings. I think we all need to come to a place where we realize that we are, in fact, all ragamuffins. If we forget where we've come from, Paul the Apostle says, even on my best days, I'm only presenting filthy rags before God. Paul never forgot that he, in fact, was a ragamuffin. And that he walked around on this earth, not with his chest puffed out, because he was something great. For he was not something great. He was, as Jesus described, poor, wretched, naked, blind. And it was only by the grace of God that he was something and so Jesus is saying to these Christians, to this church in this place, he's saying there in verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy gold from me, gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich. See, they were not rich. They thought riches came from physical wealth, from dollars or coins or things like that. That's not what makes you rich. He says, buy from me this gold that's refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Listen to me, I want to make a point to you this morning. They didn't have enough money to buy these things that Jesus was telling them to buy. They could not afford the things that he was offering. I think he's, it's a play on words when he says, come and buy from me gold refined in the fire. They were a rich people, but they couldn't afford to buy what Jesus was offering. It wasn't something you could purchase. And so he goes on to say in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. The only way they could receive these wonderful riches from God was to repent was to turn from their ways and to turn back to God, to humble themselves. And so he says this, Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. In the Jewish culture, eating a meal with somebody was very special. It was as if you were saying, I want to be your best friend. Let's get to know each other. Let's hang out. Let's spend time together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up my life to you. I'm going to remove the barriers that exist. I'm inviting you in. Come in and be with me. And so when Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knocking, and if anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I want to come into your life. I want to get past all of the barriers. I want to come right into where you are. Right into that place of, of dysfunction, of ugliness. And I want to share a meal with you. And I want to be with you. And he says, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Listen, this is a personal decision. Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, we must not talk about setting the church right. We must pray for grace, each one for himself. The church will only get right by each man getting right. It is a personal responsibility that we must own. 
And so the humble ragamuffin versus the proud ragamuffin. What is the difference? The humble ragamuffin knows where he came from and who he is. He does not try to be something that he is not. He is humble and comfortable in his state. In fact, the ugliness and the maredness just makes him that much more special and unique. It tells a story. And just to exist and be available to love and be present whenever called upon is the purpose of a ragamuffin. The humble ragamuffin knows that he is only something special because of the one who loves him and cherishes him and carries him along. And so too is the Christian when we humble ourselves and we give ourselves to Jesus. We are only special because he's loved us and he's brought us to himself and he carries us around. God does not like the proud ragamuffin, but he loves the humble ragamuffin and brings them in and carries them. Listen, we need to repent. We need to understand who we are and where we are before God. Let me pray for us. Lord, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much that you are standing at the door of our lives and you are knocking. And here we are in this state as ragamuffins. Help us not to miss the fact that we are so far from righteous, that we are broken and battered and in desperate need of your grace and presence in our life. Maybe that's you today. Maybe today you would say to me, Chris, I'm a ragamuffin. I mean, you have no idea the brokenness in my life. And I'm a ragamuffin. And I need Jesus in my life. I, I want to be loved by him. I want to be accepted by him. I want to invite him in. If that's you today, if you're saying, I'm a ragamuffin, and I know I'm nothing on my own, but I know that Jesus died on the cross for me. I know that he loves me. And I want to give my life to him. If that's you today, I want to invite you to stand up. Just right where you're sitting. Listen, it doesn't matter what anybody else in this room thinks. This is between you and God. This is your chance to say, Lord, I desperately need you in my life. And I want to give my life to you. If that's you today, I want to invite you to stand. Maybe you're listening online. If, if you're listening online, I'll invite you to stand too. Or raise your hand and say, that's me. That's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Listen, if you're making that decision today, I want to say a prayer with you. You don't have to say this prayer out loud. You could say it in your heart and your mind to God. But I just want you to tell him today how much you desperately need him in your life. Tell him that you've made a lot of mistakes. Ask him to forgive you. You see, the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And then invite him into your life. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Ask him to save you. And thank him for saving you. Lord, I pray for those who have prayed that prayer today. Would you bless them? Would this day be a special day in their lives as they've gone from darkness to light, as they find themselves now sitting at the table with you, forgiven. And for the rest of us, Lord, who have made that decision in the past but find ourselves in a place of spiritual pride, lukewarm, one foot in, one foot out, would you forgive us? We want to recommit our lives to you today, Lord, and say no longer are we going to be a lukewarm people. 
But we will love in the way that you've called us to love, and we will live in the way that you have called us to live. And so empower us to do that, we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.